There are countless ancient ruins found throughout Sri Lanka, which are all indicative of a lost technology, and thus a lost civilization having once been responsible for their creation. One of the most striking of these being the Sigiriya Mountain, an ancient stronghold made atop natural plateau, a sanctuary far away from the troubles that would have presumably been occurring below. Yet one of the most astonishing relics found within this ancient land is a rather well-hidden one. Although the water reservoir built into the Sigiriya site could offer one a subtle initial clue as to their existence, one would have to investigate the surrounding environment very carefully or be given local knowledge to ever find our next ancient anomaly in question. Hidden close by to the ancient mountainous stronghold, and now almost completely submerged into the surrounding landscape, gargantuan ancient water reservoirs, first documented by a Mr. Tennant from the UK and noted upon by William R. Corliss within one of his many volumes regarding lost civilization. Describing enormous water tanks found with the aid of the locals, all completely aligned with equally cut square blocks. One of the tanks, which the locals knew by the name Pethariacorn, has since been measured to be around 7 miles in length, 300 feet broad, with 60-foot-high earthworks along its biggest embankments. They are largely believed to have been constructed to gain complete control and subsequent mastery of irrigation throughout an impressive span of land. We approached an expert engineer to find out just what sort of feet these giant tanks would be. We received back an estimated price of around $4 million to merely construct the largest sections of the earthworks. They were undoubtedly an unimaginably large undertaking, one which we believe was beyond the capabilities of any ancient group known to modern history. Perhaps the sheer enormity of the undertaking, along with the fact that they would have been far easier to conceal than that of the Great Pyramids, for example, is a possible motive as to why there isn't more known about these marvelous groundworks, or why there is very little documented study, and why any that has been done was by independent historians. Regardless, we find these incredible, gigantic, hidden ruins highly compelling. There are many mysteries to be found within ancient Egypt. Unexplained, seemingly impossible mysteries which litter the caverns, tunnels, flooded underground layers, and indeed the once inaccessible passageways, only recently explored using advanced modern technology. However, some of the most perplexing mysteries lay in plain sight. Not only the Great Pyramids themselves, an obvious enigma for academia to explain the construction of, but many anomalous features which can be found within objects often leaving academics baffled as to an explanation. The Cheops sarcophagus being one such anomaly. Although these pyramids are entered and explored by millions of people every year, and indeed, this mysterious sarcophagus shown to many of these inquisitive explorers, what many the funded academic tour guide often leaves absent from their explanation of this supposed tomb is how exactly it arrived at its current location. As we have explored and exposed previously, the casing stones that can be found on many of the pyramids are to us not only indicative of another phase of construction work, once having been undertaken upon these structures, but due to the erosion present and the different styles featured, are in fact indicative of more than one attempt to conserve these marvelous structures for future generations. Thus, one must conclude by more than one now extinct advanced civilization. As such, the age of the sarcophagus of Cheops could be immense. So it is not surprising that it has encountered not only grave robbers, but has been vandalized also at points within the distant past. Furthermore, and perhaps most intriguing and frustrating, is that the sarcophagus lid is missing, a lid that could have explained the past contents of this mysterious box. Or like the tomb of Pakal, exposed extremely controversial illustrations of possible past technologies. 
Unfortunately, however, or rather most conveniently for academics, this lid has never been discovered. Yet what is most perplexing regarding this diorite box, notably one of the hardest workable stones on Earth, is that no one seems to know how the original builders managed to transport the box to its current location deep within the bowels of Cheops. The diameter of this supposed tomb, being too large to have traveled down any of the known tunnels, which have so far been discovered within the ancient pyramid. This leaves us with two likely possibilities. One, that the diorite box was placed there and the pyramid built around it, which is a mysterious and confusing hypothesis, mostly due to the lack of markings of significance found upon the sarcophagus or indeed the lack of any dedicative markings found anywhere else surrounding it. It is as though the box was placed there without much effort to indicate any importance to his existence. Yet, to cut such a box, which has since been discovered to have been cast from one single block of diorite, would have taken tremendous effort, a feat that modern man would only accomplish with the use of diamond-edged power tools, not to mention the effort that would have been involved in moving this multi-ton stone into its found location. The second hypothesis regarding how this sarcophagus found its way into its current location is that the box itself was transported to its found location through tunnels and passageways we are yet to discover, possibly hinting at the fact that within this great pyramid, there are indeed many more hidden layers and cavities we are yet to explore or discover. Maybe the placement of this seemingly inanimate box was placed there to suggest exactly this. Furthermore, what was on the lid of this supposed sarcophagus? Why is it known as the sarcophagus of Khufu, when Khufu was not discovered within it? In fact, nothing was discovered within it. And why is the lid mysteriously absent? Where did the lid to this sarcophagus go? Why, if destroyed by grave robbers, was it not left where it lay? Did this lid contain controversial information? possibly pertaining to the original contents or indeed purpose of the Great Pyramids? We find the diorite sarcophagus of Khufu, and indeed its unexplainable journey into the center of the pyramid, highly compelling. We have, on many occasions, covered the many astonishing ancient rock-cut structures which can be found virtually all over the world. Megalithic creations, often carved from a single piece of stone or dry-built constructed out of impossibly huge stones, and recently, we have touched upon the more impressive stone sites to be found, such as the horseshoe-shaped piece of granite, decided upon by someone or something, as the base rock for what many perceive to be the most impressive artistic wonder on Earth. A structure named after a mountain, we also suspect, has witnessed extreme excavation work in the past, as did the Giza Plateau. Indeed, although little known, acres of solid natural stone were excavated from the Giza Plateau as the foundation bed for the most incredibly elaborate pyramid found anywhere. Who could have accomplished such gargantuan tasks over 3,000 years ago? But I digress. Our topic of this video is a wonderful gem hidden upon our Earth. In fact, the largest and seemingly most impressive of them all. So impressive, in fact, a number of individuals, specialists, tasked with the investigation of this astonishing structure and the construction thereof, some for over 12 years of extensive investigation, have been resigned to the conclusion alien influences could have only been responsible for the completion of the structure at such an ancient time in our history. Known as the Lost City of Angkor, this due to its extended duration hidden beneath several thousand highly established tree roots. It was once the capital city of the Khmer Empire, which flourished from approximately the 9th to 15th centuries. However, a similar theory can be applied regarding the Khmer Empire's success to the ancient Egyptian civilization's notorious longevity. It is, of course, a possibility that we have covered regarding Giza before, that these ancient cultures partook in probably the earliest form of graffiti, 
presumably ordered by the current rulers, to add their own deity depictions to these already ancient and astonishing structures. It would be a logical decision for a successful leader of an ancient group of people, namely self-declared Hindu monarch Jayavarman II, who also declared himself a universal monarch and a god-king, to make the decision to claim such mastery as their own creation. When visitors entered the area, they would immediately assume that your group had constructed this awe-inspiring temple, undoubtedly intimidating and additionally giving incredible security to your people, as the temple even possessed an impressive moat, an instant advantage over all surrounding tribes. Not hewn from a single rock, but created using no less impressive techniques, undoubtedly requiring the same perfection in artistic ability as Kailash Temple. Five million blank stone blocks were perfectly laid upon one another, slowly forming a template. These stones were then individually and perfectly carved into the astonishing wonder we see before us today. As the blocks were pre-laid, this means whoever the sculptors were had only one chance to get the carvings right, a feat they seemingly accomplished. Who built the lost city of Angkor? Kailash? The pyramids? Baalbek, etc., etc.? The list of utterly perplexing sites grows every day, but thankfully, so does our knowledge. Andara, a site covered in the past, yet for an entirely different reason. Our experience along this path of discovery, now allowing one a window, a glimpse, into a deeper, more compounding layer of evidential detail. Unraveling a tangled web of lies, weaved over generations of regurgitated fiction. Accompanied by supportive evidence to again reinforce the original instinctual hypothesis created some 10 years ago now. In particular, in regard to who could have, in reality, possibly created these mind-blowing or gargantuan ancient megalithic ruins. Sites we have touched upon or researched in the past, however from a less experienced evidential angle. Thus we feel they are justified a refined revisit. Yet I digress. Ayandara is a claimed Iron Age settlement. Yet what I am about to demonstrate is that not only is this yet another lie, but that the evidence be overwhelming to support this claim. The choice of stone used in these once exquisitely finished ruins decoration, for example, not only reminiscent of Persepolis, but due to its clearly much greater level of erosion, it would also, as the art would suggest, far predate Persepolis itself. Yet the belief structure, the artistic evolution, and by default, the same civilization responsible for both and indeed the mythological depictions are undeniably linked. Ayandara being located in Syria and claimed as dating as far back as the Iron Age. We have covered the magnificent Lamassu, found within Persepolis within a two-part special previously. This extraordinary, seemingly superhumanly precise stone-carved sanctuary, however, although clearly possessing a more advanced depiction of the same creatures found at an apparent Iron Age basalt site, which is actually geographically over 1,500 kilometers away and dated to a completely different era, regardless of academic opinion, share unarguable evidential similarities and due to erosion levels can be correlated with the evolution of the depictions along with the civilization responsible's past yet now lost abilities. From Ayandara to the Lamassu of Persepolis is clearly an artistic evolution of the mythical creatures depicted on the basalt stones claimed as Iron Age within Ayandara. Furthermore, although only a suspiciously tiny portion remains of the basalt floor, a quietly guarded area found at the foot of Cheops upon the Giza Plateau, or more accurately foundation, although only a remnant of what once was probably one of the most significant parts of the ancient ruins themselves, it still holds countless undeniable curious tool marks, each of which clearly made with a tool unarguably tremendously more powerful and capable 
than that of what academics claim the builders of the pyramids and their constructors wielded, that of copper tools. It all but now seems an insult to one's intelligence. We clearly find Ayandara highly compelling. When people visit the southeastern Anatolian province of Mardin, this gem of lost antiquity quietly sits, often overlooked, and when one begins to investigate said site, they are often left with more questions than answers. For why does such an astonishing ruin go largely unnoticed? Why is it not more largely discussed within archaeological circles? Could it be due to the fact, as one with any level of knowledge regarding lost civilizations and the proof therein latches eyes upon the site, they instantly recognize its characteristics synonymous with these studies, matching other, yet rather interestingly, accidentally revealed ruins from around the world. The style of, and the decision to bore the dwellings from solid stone, reminiscent of many unexplained ruins, such as the underground city of Derinkuyu, a particularly interesting site when indeed discovered entirely by accident one which to this day remains heavily debated and, to some, highly controversial. This site, known as Dara, is exhibiting geological processes which are now, unfortunately, beginning to erode it back into the landscape. The construction technique, however, still testament to its original builder's abilities and, indeed, its possible age. Yet this does not answer the question, as to why this ruin goes largely untalked of, largely unstudied and overlooked. For parallel to the erosion argument exhibiting its true age, it can also be used as an advocate for its official dating within the Byzantine era. The lack of surviving ruins will often be used as a way to dismiss such claims of antiquity due to a lack of evidence. Thus, we wanted to dig a little deeper to see if, via visual evidence, we could confirm that there is indeed reason to suspect that the site could possibly generate controversy for those who originally dated the site. This to confirm our initial suspicions. Still, surviving tool marks present upon the stones match that of other controversially dated sites. How can a ruin apparently dating from the Bronze Age exhibit such long cut marks or finishes across the stone? Like that of the ancient pyramids, how could copper tools have accomplished such feats within Dara, Giza, and the other sites around the world? It is a question which we find highly compelling. There are many unusual artifacts that can now be thankfully found within countless private collections all over the world, all of them currently unexplained by modern science. Stones made from pure oxygen metal objects created in a zero-g environment, unexplained glass cups, slabs, and tools, the list grows, and our next artifact of interest could have even once resided within the legendary city of Atlantis. 47 pieces of a mysterious alloy many have attributed to a metal once known as orichalcum. A metal, many say, was only ever found within the once highly advanced city of Atlantis. Discovered within a shipwreck off the coast of Sicily, they were found during an expedition to a wreck believed to be over 2,600 years old. The ship was previously explored in 2015, when underwater archaeologists found 39 ingots of another mysterious metal, the details of which not yet released to the public. This trip, however, yielded an ancient jar, two Corinthian helmets, and the 47 lumps of ancient orichalcum, said to have been smelted upon the fabled island of Atlantis. Plato specifically described this rare metal as having been mined there. He even described a temple dedicated to Poseidon, having an entire pillar made from orichalcum. Interestingly, after the discovery in 2005, officials began to conceal the true identity of this mysterious metal, attributing other metals, such as copper and gold, found at the site as orichalcum. News Corp Australia also reported that tradition had it that orichalcum was made of copper, gold, and silver, this statement having no historical accuracy whatsoever. 
Furthermore, the metal found by the shipwreck team was said to have matched the ancient descriptions of Orichalcum. Are they really surviving artifacts from the lost city of Atlantis? They are undoubtedly incredible ancient artifacts and compelling evidence to support the past existence of a highly advanced civilization that once flourished here upon our planet. What exactly is Orichalcum, and why is it mentioned within so many ancient texts pertaining to the past existence of Atlantis? And why are the dive team and the subsequent researchers of their finds so convinced of the alloy's identity we find the discovery highly compelling? Previously, we covered the strange but highly intriguing Cockno Stone, an extremely ancient and very large Scottish stone covered with some of the best and most interesting ancient petroglyphs known in Europe. And although we put forward the preposition of it possibly being a map of as yet unknown star constellations, we were subsequently contacted by an independent researcher known as Sean Moriarty, who, with a small independent team, has been investigating the stone for quite some time resulting in them deciphering the enigmatic cup and ring marks as a map of all the ancient sites within the surrounding area, including some yet to be unearthed. However, there is a little less known ancient stone, a stone which rests in North Carolina, deep within the mountains of Jackson County, and it has baffled all but a few who've examined it. Known as the Judicula Rock, it is a soapstone boulder covered with a plethora of strange petroglyphic drawings that archaeologists now believe to be over 3,000 years old. The native Cherokee Indians consider the site sacred and state that it's extremely ancient. The rock has been studied by researchers from across the world, but no one was ever able to decipher the bizarre petroglyphs on the stone, not even being able to connect them vaguely to any usual subject matter often selected for such ancient expressions. It's also cut using an unknown technique made by an unknown people. The stone sits at the base of a mountain that has a large vein of copper which runs under the site. With a variety of other rare metals and minerals present, this geological layout has often been used to explain the strange electromagnetic anomalies which can be detected around the rock. The League of Energy Materialization and Unexplained Phenomena Research, or LEMA for short, a team of highly qualified individuals who explore paranormal and enigmatic subjects, may have actually cracked the code, and their research is certainly the most compelling proposition so far put forward, or quite possibly will ever be put forward. In August of 2002, LEMA investigated Judicula Rock, Upon comparing Judicula's markings to microscopic forms, specifically microscopic pond life, some of which exclusively native to the surrounding landscape, an artistic relationship becomes undeniable. Modern academia, or indeed known history, states that man first saw microscopic creatures in September 1674. These observations were made by Dutch scientist Anton van Leeuwenhoek, that means humans have only known of microscopic life for less than 330 years. If this is true, who or what could have created the Judicula stone's markings over 3,000 years ago? Was this stone made by a highly advanced ancient alien? Was it made with the purpose of sharing their research with a local population unable of such work? To date, the Lima theory is the only one which has been successfully corroborated elsewhere.